my partner's down there. Are we ready? Are we going and everything? Cool. Well, I am going to say good morning. It is so nice to see faces. I'm also very, very glad to see some of you still have your masks on. Again, it is up to you at this point. This is the Sunday where it goes back to you. If you want to wear them, please do. Again, we know that comfort levels are different. And just because now we're taking this off, it also means other nice germs are gonna show up. So maybe, you know, everyone has their own time. So please, I'm very glad if you want to wear them, please don't feel any pressure that you have to take them off or you have to conform or you have to do any of that stuff. Do what you need to do. So uh, it's, it's good to see you. And it's also good to see, like I said, it's nice to see faces that I haven't seen uh, in a while. Not that you all don't have just the most beautiful eyes. And you can communicate with your eyes. Uh, we have a couple of announcements for you today. I think one of the biggest things to look at is the calendar page insert that shows things going on. I know we have new things starting this week. Uh, this today, which I'm sure Meg will talk about in a minute, confirmation today. begins. We've got a new class. Uh, starting tomorrow night at 7. Uh, if you signed up for that, I will see you in the library in the other building. Uh, so that starts this week as well. I know for our Bible study, which takes place on Wednesdays at 11, we are going to go back and have lunch afterwards. So it's going to be nice. We'll actually get the study and then eat and have some fellowship afterwards. Uh, with that... And I think that's all the list that I had in my head. And there's session meeting this week, but that's, you know, that's its own special thing. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. But it's all getting to next Sunday, which, if you do not know yet, next Sunday is the worst Sunday of the year. Because next Sunday, we oh, spring forward yeah. and we lose an hour. We so do. this year, I would really appreciate it if you wrote your senator or congressperson and said, look, if you're not going to get rid of this foolishness, at least could we maybe move it to Saturday morning when we do this stuff? You know, who made the bright idea? Let's do it on Sunday. Ben Franklin. Yeah, yeah. Let's do it on Monday for a while. See how you guys like it when your work day starts. At... Anyway. I could feel go like on you and need on. to keep I going. Can, look, I just got to get it out sometimes. You just got to get it out sometimes. <laughs> no, no, I'll have my alarm set. I will be here. I will be here. We'll do it. But that's, that's happening next Sunday. Uh, and I think that was about, oh, uh, if you have not looked ahead, know that we are having a congregational meeting today. And me, being the terrible pastor that I am, I always put it in the service so you can't escape. You have to stay. Uh, but I get to walk out on this one, so uh, I get to leave early. <laughs> um, but that is happening today. All right, I'll turn it over to you now. Get all my papers in order. Good morning. Wow, it is so good to be back home. Last Sunday, I worshipped in Little Rock, Arkansas at Second Presbyterian there, and it was a great experience, but I also missed being here with you guys, so it's so nice to be back and see all of you. I'm assuming you're smiling under your mask, <laughs> so we're going with that this morning. Okay. Just a couple quick Meg announcements. Uh, we are starting confirmation today. Um, so that'll be at 4.15 in the youth room. Um, and then we'll do that. And then we have youth this evening as well. 5.30 middle schoolers, 6.30 high schoolers. I'll send out a text so you can be reminded. Um, I think that might be it. Wow. That was, that was quick and easy. That was quick and easy. Are there other announcements or news that anybody would like to share before we begin? Other announcements? I did see that. I did see that. As a Carolina alumni, that 
I won't say any more about that. <laughs> Anything else? Any other news or things happening that anybody would like to share today? Then let us turn our hearts and our minds over to the worship of God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the community of the Holy Spirit be with you all. You who live in the shelter of the Most High, who abide in the shadow of the Almighty, will say to the Lord, Saints, let us worship the Lord God with the singing of our first hymn, number 694, Great God of Every Blessing. Please stand. You may be seated. Are you thirsty for grace, 
Are you hungry for mercy? God is calling. Come to the waters. Trusting in God's grace, let us confess our sin. Merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you. We desire earthly kingdoms and dismiss your heavenly realm. We seek to provide for ourselves and spurn the bread of life you offer. Quiet us, Lord. Take away the distractions from grace's truth in this time of silent, reflective prayer. Forgive us, God of grace. Teach us to rely on your saving word, to trust in your sustaining care, and to worship and serve you alone. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Saints, listen so that you may live. The steadfast love of God never fails. In the name of Jesus Christ, no that we are forgiven. And at this time, let us stand and greet one another with the peace of Christ. And I need children, children, children. <laughs> I need your help today. I need you special today. I know you're getting too old to come up here. Come up here, Lena. I was really hoping you'd be here. Come over here with me. You stand with me. Great job on that, too. Saw you had some, you know, it's a little iffy, but you got it. You got it done. All right. I have my, my assistant here today. Uh, this is Duck Lips Jackson. What are you doing with the... Okay. Anyway, I've got Jackson with me today. He's going he's gonna to help me out, because today 
Uh, this is the first Sunday in Lent. We've changed colors, so something has changed. Something different is going on. And today, on the first Sunday in Lent, we always read this story about Jesus going into uh, the wilderness to be tempted. So, my first question to you is, do you know what it is to be tempted? What it, well, not necessarily forced. Sometimes it can feel that way, huh? Not even demand it. Sometimes, let, we're going to do it, we're going to do something. I love watching cartoons. And even, I'm going to, she's not in here, right? So even on like Saturday mornings, my wife and I, when we first get up, you know, growing up, we're supposed to watch important stuff. We watch cartoons. We watch old Scooby-Doo cartoons and drink our coffee and have a good time. But I love cartoons. And one of the things that happens in cartoons, come up here, Meg, that has to do with temptation is often there's a character in the cartoon. So this is our character in the cartoon. And let's say this character, he's a, they're usually decent characters in the cartoon. You're going to have to come over here. He's usually decent. And then suddenly, like this little devil kind of pops up on his uh, side there. And it's like, hey, hey, you need to stick out your tongue at these people. Yeah, yeah, that's what you need to do. You need to stick out your tongue and go, nah, nah. Be mean, yeah, yeah. But in the cartoons, even as the devil pops up on this shoulder, always on the other shoulder, there's this angel that pops up. We don't do that. We don't, we shouldn't do that. Ah, don't, don't listen to her. Don't listen to her. You need to stick your tongue out at them. Nah, nah, nah. You need to, you need to do what I'm telling you to do. Don't, don't listen to her. She's no good. Nah. So this is kind of what temptation is about. You get an idea or some thought comes into your head and most of the time, most of the time, you already know it's the wrong idea. It's the wrong thought. And yeah, maybe I shouldn't do that. Stick your tongue out, stick your tongue out. Go ahead, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on. <laughs> but then something else happens and you know that uh, it begins to advise you that yeah, the consequences. You're going to, look, look, you've, you've hurt somebody's feelings. She's going to begin to cry because you stuck your tongue out at her. Even her little otter is not going to keep her safe. Oh, look how sad. Look how sad. Oh. Who cares? Stick your tongue out. <laughs> so in this story, the first story of Lent is always about being able being able, you come over here, Deep. Being able to resist temptation and still do the right thing. And that's tough because it happens. Look, look, you guys, like I always say, you guys are young, but if you look out at these folks, the truth is the same thing. The same thing. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter how old you are. Doesn't matter how old you are. The same thing happens to them too. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. You wanna, you wanna do that bad thing? Don't no. You? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. That's right. No, 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 no. You gotta listen to me. I'm the one. I'm the one. We're right here. No, so, I don't want. She's very good. She's very good at resisting. So, that's that's kind of the start. That's our start for Lent. Is this story? I want to thank you very much for coming to be my helper. And since we are kind of beginning to try to get back, I need you all to stand up. I need you all to put your hands right here. Hands, 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 hands. Oh, we got to let Trevor in. Come on in. Oh, come on in, Trevor. Come on. It's all right. He's a little worried, but that's okay. Otter paw, we can do it all. Lord, we do thank you that your spirit surrounds us, that you teach us lessons so that we can turn away from temptations, that we can embrace your ways. We can remember the love that you show. We can remember the grace that you give. And we can try to follow you in that way. It is in Christ's name we pray. Amen. See you, man. See you, Trev. Thank you.
I told you, I'm on a roll. <laughs> oh, beloved, let us turn to the Lord in prayer. Holy One, give us humble, teachable, and obedient hearts. Open our ears so that we may hear your word as the scriptures are read today. We ask all of this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our first scripture reading today comes from Deuteronomy chapter 26. When you have come into the land that the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance to possess, and you possess it and settle in it, you shall take some of the first of all the fruit of the ground, which you harvest from the land that the Lord your God is giving you, and you shall put it in a basket and go to the place that the Lord your God will choose as a dwelling for his name. You shall go to the priest who is in office at that time and say to him, Today I declare to the Lord your God that I have come into the land that the Lord swore to our ancestors to give us. When the priest takes the basket from your hand and sets it down before the altar of the Lord your God, you shall make this response before the Lord your God. A wandering Aramean was my ancestor. He went down into Egypt and lived there as an alien, few in number, and there he became a great nation, mighty and populous. When the Egyptians treated us harshly and afflicted us by imposing hard labor on us, we cried to the Lord, the God of our ancestors. The Lord heard our voice and saw our affliction, our toil and our oppression. The Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, with a terrifying display of power and with signs and wonders. He brought us into this place and gave us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. So now I bring the first of the fruit of the ground that you, O Lord, have given me. You shall set it down before the Lord your God and bow down before the Lord your God. Then you, together with the Levites and the aliens who reside among you, shall celebrate with all the bounty that the Lord your God has given to you into your house. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So as you already heard on this first Sunday in Lent, we always read one form or another of Jesus being tempted in the wilderness. Today, the story comes from the gospel according to Luke. Listen as God continues to speak to you. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing at all those days, during those days, and when they were over, he was famished. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become a loaf of bread. Jesus answered him, It is written, One does not live by bread alone. Then the devil led him up and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And the devil said to him, To you I will give their glory and all this authority, for it has been given over to me, and I give it to anyone I please. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered him, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil took him to Jerusalem and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If, if you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, 
He will command his angels concerning you to protect you, and on their hands they will bear you up so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, It is said, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished every test, he departed from him until an opportune time. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I read something somewhere this week that really got me thinking differently about this story. Like so many others, I've often approached this story in in individual terms. This is Jesus and the devil, it's, it's one-on-one. I mean, these are temptations perfectly pitched to Jesus as the individual in this moment of trial, this, this moment of, of physical weakness. And Jesus is famished, so the first temptation is to, to turn stones to bread. I mean, what, what better way to tempt someone who has not eaten for days upon days And how easy is it to put myself or yourself into that situation? I mean, I I can imagine that. I can relate to that somewhat. I can probably find a a sermon illustration story about that, about how people or someone did what they knew was wrong, knowingly making the wrong choice because someone else was there ready, ready to feed their hunger. I mean, it doesn't have, to be, doesn't have to be stomach hunger, right? It could, be, it could be addictive hunger. It could be a little greed hunger. Whatever that pressure point may be. I mean, that's how these individual temptation stories work. You apply pressure to a point of weakness. I mean, we've all been in some analogous situation at one time or another. We look at temptation, and just like what we were doing with Jackson, we look at temptation and we see choice. We see personal choice, personal choice, coupled with the knowledge that what we are about to do is wrong, but we choose it anyway, because it feeds, it feeds that something within us, whatever that something happens to be. Or maybe, just maybe, we find that resolve to not, to give in to temptation, to instead hold fast to something greater than that pressure point, a principle in our life, a belief that is, that is worth upholding at all times, no matter the surrounding conditions. And we find the strength, right, to turn away. But this year, this year I want to think a little different about this story. I mean, let's begin by thinking thematically. Forty days in the wilderness, the number and the place are not an accident or coincidence. Our minds are supposed to go back to Moses and the Hebrews coming out of Egypt. The exodus from Egypt led to 40 years of of wandering in the wilderness. Forty years where the law was given. And in the wilderness, the people were supposed to be shaped and formed to become the people of God in the world. Unlike Jesus, though, they did not do as well with the temptations put before them during those 40 years, often failing miserably to their own detriment. But still, but still, the important point is that this time in the wilderness, this time in the wilderness was supposed to to help them determine who they were and, and what they were going to be as a people of this God who had just just freed them from bondage. The whole story of Exodus is God revealing to this people just who God is. I mean, they had forgotten over time. They believed that they had been forgotten after all those years in Egypt. I mean, in Egypt, even, even though they had been in bondage, they had begun to believe in other powers, the powers being wielded by the Egyptians. They had likely dreamt of freedom as having, as, 
as somehow gaining such power for themselves. I mean, isn't that often the first dream of, of people who are oppressed? The dream of power changing hands. The first dream. Not necessarily the best dream. The ten plagues God unleashes on Egypt through Moses is God revealing the limits of such power. Even as God is overwhelming the Egyptians and, and bringing them to their knees, humbling Pharaoh and his claim on divinity through displays of, of greater power. And while some will continue to define God through such definitions of power, God will, over time, reveal what true power is. We'll work to shape these people by a different definition. But we are slow learners. And it is so hard to let go. I mean, our 40 days of Lent is that yearly introspective discipline where we really take a hard look at ourselves, at the state of our church community, at how we are defining not just, not just faith, but, but so many other aspects of our lives together and individually. We look to see what temptations have ensnared us along the way. What are we having a hard time letting go of? Even knowing, even while believing what that, that little small voice inside us is telling us, keeping us perhaps from progressing in our faith, embracing what God through Christ has and is revealing. The Hebrews go out into the wilderness, but their, their transformation as a people is stunted because each challenge takes their hearts and their minds back to Egypt. They complain to Moses that he has brought them out into the wilderness to starve. They are hungry. Their appetites and their wants are not being fed as they, as they once were. I mean, back in Egypt, yes, yes, they were slaves. Yes, they were being oppressed by Egyptian power. But that power at least kept food in the flesh pots. It was a trade-off. It was a trade-off they were willing to make. To be subjugated to Egyptian power at least, at least kept their bellies full. So this first temptation Jesus faces, maybe it is more than personal. Maybe it goes beyond a single hungry holy man in the wilderness. Maybe, maybe the temptation is more about, again, what kind of Messiah this Jesus is going to be. What is truly going to be revealed of God? How many Messiahs before and since Jesus have offered the trade-off of bread for subjugation. I will fix your problems. I will keep you fed. I will make your life sweet and easy. And know that I'm the only one who can do it. Take my bread. Eat your fill. Give me power. How many dictatorships begin by first solving the bread issue? And when they do, they are hailed as a Messiah, aren't they? I mean, it's an effective temptation, no matter the form that it takes. But one does not live by bread alone. Freedom is not the move from one form of oppression to another form of oppression because the bread is better on the other side. The people are freed from bondage and leave Egypt set free to become the people of God. They do not simply trade one master for another. I mean, faith is not a form of slavery. Jesus offers his disciples bread. It is not the bread that feeds the belly. It is not the bread that is paid for with suppression. It is the bread that is, that is the broken body given to set us free from sin's bondage. Our symbol is a cross and the responsibilities of grace, not the, not the flesh pot and the promises that the flesh pot holds. 
The devil's first temptation is sly, subtle. The second one is a sledgehammer. All the kingdoms of the world are offered. An absolute theocracy. How could that be bad? I mean, it's very possible that that politician that you voted for likes that idea and is now trying to implement that idea. All, here comes the air quotes, all Christian-inspired laws are just, right? After, after all, the word Christian is there. We are on brand. How could a theocracy be a wrong move as long as we have the right religion, the right God behind that theocracy? Surely, surely nothing could go wrong there, combining state and God, the two, one, indivisible, without distinction. I know everyone, you know, everyone likes to make a big deal about the condition of the devils, that Jesus must worship him as a trade-off to this temptation. And I suppose, I suppose hubris would be a perfect form of worship for the great tempter. I mean, truly, just the slightest amount of hubris destroys all theocracies, whether they are of a certain Christian brand or not. And saints, trust me when I tell you there is not a single theocracy spouting politician who is free from hubris. Crack open any legitimate history book and find for me a fully functioning theocracy that was not undone by human hubris, you won't find it. Because we, we cannot be fully God and fully human, indivisible, without distinction. The heresy of Christian nationalism is always tempting because it, it feels so right and so natural to the, the super patriot who is also the super Christian to combine these two forces that are such positives in their lives. All these new patriot churches springing up are full of, of energetic and well-meaning people who wrap their cross with the flag because they can't tell the difference between the two, who plaster their guns with crosses without any sense of irony or understanding. And Jesus was not killed by a weapon of the state to provide cover so that we could kill with our own weapons blessed by the state. That's not the manner of messiahship that Jesus chooses while in the wilderness. I hate to break this to you, but God and never works. It's literally the first lesson of the law given to those Hebrews in the wilderness. You shall have no other gods before me. Never God and, always God only. The last temptation in the wilderness what I would call this morning the temptation of self-preservation or the temptation of assumed privilege. Now this temptation is aimed squarely at the ego. I love that this is the one that the devil turns the tables and decides to quote scripture on. The people brought out of Egypt would always fight against and fail this temptation believing that being chosen and set apart by God made them benefactors of God's protection. Being set apart meant that, that somehow, in some way, they were, they were better than their neighbors. Over and over again, they would fall back into the habits of, of testy, spoiled children. But speaking through the prophet Isaiah, God said, I will give you as a light to the nation." that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. That was the purpose. That is the purpose for being set apart. This is the clear revelation of God's intention for God's people. If Jesus chooses self-preservation, he will never be able to turn his face toward Jerusalem and the cross that is awaiting him there. If Jesus chooses self-preservation, he will never be able to leave the Garden of Gethsemane when it matters. If Jesus chooses self-preservation, he can never, with any semblance of authority or integrity, 
turn to his own disciples and tell them that if they are going to follow him, if they are going to be a light to the nations, they too will have to take up their cross daily. God's Messiah is sacrificial. The devil puts forward a, you know, a great public display of power and divine protection. Throw yourself from the, the pinnacle of the temple for all to see how the angels will serve and protect you. And how far, how far is that picture from the Jesus who will one day wrap that towel around his waist and kneel down and wash the feet of his disciples. The world needs the church that can face temptations, but then also leave the wilderness behind to do God's work in the world. I mean, look at us today. Right? Sure, sure, the pandemic seems to be winding down around us, but it is not done yet, right? It is still hard at work in different parts of the world. And as we've seen, it only takes one new variant. It only takes the virus doing what viruses do to turn everything back around. Did I see a story this morning about wild weather again? Tornadoes, where did they hit this time? The weather is getting more intense and more deadly. Climate change, it doesn't care, again, if you believe in it or not. And then what we're also seeing is that war never goes away. And these are just our top headlines for today. All right? The promises of stone to bread do not solve those problems. The promises of of divinely mandated rule, I think they exacerbate a little bit in some places, but they do not, they do not solve those problems. The promise is that if you believe hard enough and right enough, then God will keep you safe, will keep you protected from all harm. That does not solve the problem. I was moved by Meg's reading this morning. I forgot all about it, and I have to be honest, I didn't read that passage this week. How bad of me. But I was moved by the beginning part, where it talked about when you enter the land, when you get there, you fill your basket with the first of the fruits of the land, and that's what you bring to offer to God. So as we start this year's Lenten journey. What are those first fruits of the land? What are the first fruits of the, of the place that we're going to? What are going to be those fruits of the spirit that we're going to discover, we're going to embrace, we're going to put into that basket and say, Lord, this is the bounty. This is the bounty that you give to us. This, we know, is what makes us your people set apart for sacrificial service to this world that needs us so much, that needs our faith so much. It's a difficult journey, but it is the only way, the only way we finally make it out of the wilderness. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. I invite you at this time to stand and let us sing hymn number 167, 40 Days and 40 Nights.
Beloved, let us remain standing and affirm our faith with the Nicene Creed. These words are printed in your bulletin. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated. Beloved, let us go to prayer. Our most loving and gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for allowing us to be a part of your kingdom. We thank you for allowing us to be part of your church not just this church, but the church worldwide. Help us to continue to have faith that the world is in your hands and that you will care for those that need need the care of losing homes, being forced to leave countries, having having to survive and suffer through natural disasters. Help us continue, Lord, to pray to you every day. Pray without ceasing to bring peace, love, and tranquility to this terrible world that we're in right now. It's really not a terrible word world, Lord, because it is your domain. Thank you for allowing us to be part of that. Lord, we have many people in our prayer, on our prayer list that need healing. And we have people that have come off the prayer list, and we are grateful and thankful that you, you have brought healing and wholeness into their lives. And now, Lord, we lift up to you those that need healing and your wholeness. Hear our prayers of and petitions, Lord. Watch over us and care for us. We know that the devil is always there, tempting, tempting us to do what we should not. We ask that you give us the strength, you give us the courage to live our lives and to do your will. 
And now, Lord, we lift up our voices to you as we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We continue now in our worship with the giving of our tithes and our offerings. Before we go to prayer, I ask something special that, of you that this week especially you remember Jim Hill and his family in prayer. Um, I'm just going to say that. So pray with me. Gracious Lord, we come before you as disciples called. And we pray always that you will increase our faith that you will help us to hear your voice above all others, that you will give us the courage and the strength to embrace your ways as shown through us through our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for all that you give, for the gifts that we are able to hold in our hands, for the spiritual gifts that we hold in our hearts. We know all that you give is to be used to your service. Direct us, Lord. Guide us. Move our feet. Be the strength in our hands. Give, give our words voice so that we may share your gospel in all the world. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. this time you may be seated and as mayor is up front already he is leading you in the congregational meeting uh, my name is Maher Gindi I'm here on behalf of the finance committee uh, the reason of that meeting is to update you on Tom's uh, compensation uh, Tom's been with us for the last five years and his agreement with the uh, pastor nominating committee 
they agree to a raise of 1% every year for the next five years. Since this is fifth year, he is getting 5% raise. And this raise is for his total compensation, which includes his salary of $55,000 and his housing for $15,000, total of $70,000. So the 5% of the 70,000 is 3,500. So this year his total compensation is uh, $73,500. If you look to the budget, it still mention his salary as 55, his housing as 15, because he elected to deposit all his raise in the retirement account. And that's it. Any questions about Tom's uh, compensation or any question about any financial questions? All right, thank you. Stand and sing our final hymn, number 783, When We Are Tested. as you go out into the world. Support your faith with goodness, and goodness with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with endurance, and endurance with godliness, and godliness with mutual affection, and mutual affection with love. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you. 
too. I just like, please stop. <laughs>